All right, so hopefully by the end of the next couple of weeks, we can do the, the following three things. Explain what genes are and how they make up different characteristics. Describe how genetic traits can be passed on to future generations. And then describe how different genetic inheritance principles can cause variations oops, in future generations. So, um, Gregor Mendel, does he sound familiar? With the peas, anybody? Anybody? I'm seeing a couple of yeses. So he was um, an Austrian monk, pretty cool dude, to be honest. But his life was very not fun. His parents were peasants, meaning that they I don't know why. Meaning that they were poor, and they worked for the church. Okay, this is like 1700-ish time, and so. He was born into poverty, didn't know anything other than what we would probably call like modern day slavery. Okay, that's what a peasant was. He is pushed heavily by his parents to go to school because they want him to be more successful than they were. Common, right? So he um, studies first at the University of Cambridge and comes up with this big degree at the time that's very, very fancy, and then decides, actually, like blood and guts kind of freaks me out. Like, I don't, I don't wanna be a doctor, I, I don't think so. So he, then he goes to the University of Vienna and kind of picks up a math kind of idea, still is unsure, like, I don't know, you know, his parents were at first like, yeah, that's great, go. Go to school, get educated, and then they're like, wait, we'll come back. And so he ends up becoming an Austrian monk. So it's basically the priesthood. So they live in a big monastery. They rely strictly on people of the church to pay for their food, their living, everything that they need. Okay, they cannot really make money in any way, shape, or form. His job at the monastery was to maintain the garden. If they didn't have a garden, they didn't eat. So he had a really, really important job, which is which is nice. I mean, he wasn't gonna go anywhere, people treated him nicely. But he starts studying these garden peas. Okay, the same kind of peas, you know, like you get at school lunch, you get the frozen bag. Same kind of peas. And he realizes that there is some sort of a pattern when they're growing. And because of his science and math background, of course, he wants to kind of break that data down. And so he learned from this that there are two distinct forms of every single trait in garden peas. Okay, go ahead and sketch this table out. We'll come back to it a lot. You don't have to draw pictures. Just make the table. But there are two very distinct traits. So for the plant height, there was tall plant or short plant. Nothing in between, nothing. There were round seeds or wrinkled seeds, nothing in between. There were yellow seeds or green seeds, nothing in between. They either had a green coat or a white coat, nothing in between. They had inflated or full pods, or they were all constricted and sucked in. Nothing in between. There were green or yellow pods. Nothing in between. And the flower position was either, either axial, so it means they come off in random spots along the plant, or they were terminal, meaning they were only on the, the ends of like the top. They would only be on the ends. does, which I quite frankly would find incredibly boring, but I guess if I was a monk living in a monastery, I would want something to do as well. He literally counts and categorizes every single pea for years. This is all he did for years, plural. Like imagine talking about the characteristics of life every day all day for years I would go I would go crazy and so he starts coming up
example of this, this data, and we're going to look at it in a minute. But plot twist, this guy named T.A. Knight, he was also looking at the data at a different king farm, basically, different monastery, to be honest, and saw the same relationship, saw the exact same table that we're looking at, but never tabulated the data. So he doesn't get any of the credit. Okay, Gregor Mendel is arguably the father of genetics, but T.A. Knight arguably also found found it out first, just didn't publish it or tabulate anything, so it wasn't worth anything. So there's a lot of um, scientific argument about who actually is the father of genetics. It is definitely Mendel. nice about growing peas, so he, they also grew other things in the garden, but you could get a lot of peas and a lot of plants in a small area. How many of you have ever seen like a plant, a pea plant? Okay, they're not, they're not real big, similar to like a soybean plant. They're not real big, they produce a lot, so you can get a lot of numbers or a lot of trials which hopefully we know in science, the more trials you, the more accurate your data is. And a small, amount of, a small amount of space, remember they're living in a monastery, so it would be like their, their whole garden to feed all these men, probably 50 to 100 of them for the year, probably had to fit in this room. So a small amount of space, large amounts of data, and they grew quickly. So as soon as he harvested one set, he would plant another one only takes three-ish months to harvest, do it again, and again, and again, and again. Super, super beneficial in terms of data for science. So the experimental design was really, really, really important. Okay, this is pretty much the reason that we're able to take Gregor Mendel's science so seriously. He focused on one trait at a time. So like I said, when he grew up, you know, the first row, he harvested it. And redo it over and over and over. Every time he grew a set of plants, he only focused on one thing. Okay, which is important because we're able to control all the factors in the experiment and it doesn't get messy. Okay, we call this the rule of one. In science, it's a pretty big deal, the rule of one. that was really important was his order in which he let the plants fertilize themselves. So for several generations, he allowed them to self-pollinate. That first generation we called the P generation. Or the, the parental. 
Okay, they were the parents. They were the first plants. And that self-pollination allows for a very clear, distinct trait from the plant. We're not taking two different parents, essentially, and getting a mixed set of traits. So it's really, really important that we develop that P generation. Then he took two P generation plants with different expressions of the same trait. So the tall and the short, the yellow and the green, the green and the white, whatever it was, whatever he was focusing on in the rule of one, and then he crossed them. So I'm gonna do P times P, and that gives us F1. F meaning familial. Then he counted those plants. This is the first set of plants that he counted. That's the first set that he counted in all of his data. Then he allows the F1s to self-pollinate. Again, so we're not taking the dad plant of one and the mom plant of another and crossing them and we get like a weird mix of plants. We're just allowing them to self-pollinate. So if it was purple flowers, we're gonna keep getting purple flowers, hopefully. Otherwise that data had to be trashed. If it was white flowers, we should keep getting white flowers here. So then we let these guys self-pollinate. We'll do F1 times F1. And that gives us the F2 generation. Okay, again, F meaning familial. It's just the second set of offspring. So if this was you down here, this would be your parents and then your grandparents would be a way to look at it. And then he counted the expression of that as well. And he does this over and over and over for years and keeps track of the data. And so he gets this data that looks like this. Which is pretty cool. This is like his legit typed up, maybe little data in his entire pea plant experiment. Okay, so obviously it's not in English. Okay, remember he was Austrian. 
So if we scoot down, this uh, starts talking about all the different things he's looking at. Um, therefore, it mentions T.A. Knight uh, right here. Remember I talked about him kind of, he saw it first but never really took it seriously. So he does mention him, which is nice in the scientific world because normally it would be like, hey, loser. Like I'm getting all the credit. So he does mention him, which I think says a lot about Mendel's character. But then if we keep looking, we'll get to his data. So here's where he talks about how he does all the different numbers. There's some sets of data on 15 plants. So, we're looking at here, hold on, I had to write this down because I did look it up and what it meant. So this flans word here means like the phase or the trial. And then round and wrinkled. And this is the shape of seed is literally what that means. And so this is his legitimate data. He had 45 in his first plant that were round and 12 that were wrinkled. And then the second one is the coloring of the seed. That albumin means color. And so it's yellow is the gelb and then green is groom. This is his legit data. And if we sat down, like I nerdily did, and translated a lot of this, it goes step by step about what he did and how he did it and why he did it and how he collected it. And what he goes on to do is find this very particular almost formula, what we should see in the genetics of these plants. So we have a big A, I want you to write this down somewhere, just small, just as a reminder. A big A plus two big A little a plus little a. It will come back to haunt us, I promise. The last one is a little a, yeah. Big A plus two big A little a plus little a. scientific report he wrote, each plant has two heritable factors or things that we can inherit. Okay, that's the, the round versus wrinkled, the tall versus short, purple versus white, all of those. We get one trait from each parent and it is totally random. Okay, he found this all out just from studying peas. Those factors, we call them genes now, and the forms of those factors we call alleles. And these alleles can be dominant or recessive. Do those words sound familiar? Dominant, recessive, a head nod, yes or no? Okay. they can be dominant or recessive. For those of you that nodded your head, yes, this sounds familiar. What is dominant? Can you give me an example of what dominant means? Go, Dylan. Um, the 
drink that shows more in the offspring? Yeah, so the one that usually we see. And what about recessive? Somebody help them out. Do the other half. Go, Cord. Uh, Good. And these genes can be heterozygous or homozygous. Are those words familiar? Just a yes or no, homozygous, heterozygous. Some of you are saying yes, good. All right, somebody who said yes, these sound familiar. What is homozygous? Go out and pee. The same, good. And what about heterozygous? They're opposites of each other, does that help? Or like, they're different. Each of these genes is going to have kind of two names. We can have the genotype and the phenotype. Do those words sound familiar? Somebody said yes, tell me what phenotype is. Even if you just take a stab at it, like, yeah, it sounds familiar. I think it might mean. So these words don't sound familiar then? Lily, hit me. The physical traits, good. And then what about genotype? Go get one. Like the, the gene portion. So these six words are going to be foundational to the rest of the year, the year, okay? Foundational to the rest of the year. And I'm getting like a, eh, yeah, they sound kind of familiar to most of us, which is good. like thoughts, questions, concerns. Where are we stuck? Remember, keep that, that mindset. I could write a paragraph about what we just did. Thoughts, questions, concerns. All right. Let some of you finish. You are done writing down what's on the board. You need one sheet of white paper.
I don't know if it'll show the color. I mean, it might. If I scan it and post it, it will. Okay. Not if I copy it. So we'll just do that. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. I'm actually going to swing over to this for a minute. 